Carrie Rubenstein, who is a geriatrician uh, at Providence Swedish and directs the Geriatric Fellowship on a primary care age-friendly approach to delirium prevention. And then Dr. Sylvia Russo is going to present a case, uh, a practice dilemma. So if you can rename yourself with your um, first and last name and clinic, um, mute when you're not speaking, please, and unmute and say your name. Turn your video on if you can, but of course we understand if you can't. But we do like to see everyone's faces. It sort of helps build community and connection. If there's more than one person in the room um, or on the call, please list those names as well in the chat. Um, so there's been a recent shift in um, CME accreditation, uh, um, accreditation. So for all UW faculty, staff, or students, complete the mobile text registration and sign in. And if you've not registered yet, you see this, um, send your email address to this phone number, 833-394-7078. And then you'll get a prompt, um, hopefully stating that your number has been updated. If you don't receive this message, then you can sign in here. After uh, registration, then you can text 8578. We will um, share this number again at the end of uh, our uh, session. Um, and then once you text that, you should receive a response saying, thank you, so-and-so, we've recorded your attendance. And our Dementia Echo uh, has code DS2345. For anyone else who's attending, for all our all other attendees, and we know there's lots of attendees throughout the state of Washington, we will record your attendance and um, through Zoom Analytics and by the program manager, by Sammy. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so please do ensure that you're displaying your full name and then Sammy can reach out to you in the chat if she needs additional information to track CME credit. Okay. There's a number of other uh, wonderful talks and echoes that uh, University of Washington has. I'm not gonna read all of these, but um, I will just leave them on the screen for a moment for you to review. There's a telephone consultation uh, to help guide complex pain regimens, especially with high dose opioids you see here. And then there's a terrific CME accredited uh, case conference, uh, the UW Telepain series as well. Last but not least, there's a fantastic series of grand rounds through University of Washington Psychiatry um, which you can watch. Uh, they've been recorded and are available as well. Um, please do take a moment to consider uh, completing the survey. The Dementia Action Collaborative is really interested in hearing uh, from you about you know, the barriers and challenges of screening, diagnosing, and caring for people living with dementia. So uh, please complete the survey link. Um, here you see the QR code. And we, we really appreciate your time and feedback. So the Dementia Action Collaborative will then make uh, recommendations based on that feedback and input and participation is of course voluntary, but, and the responses are anonymous um, and it really helps to shape um, the impact uh, and thinking that the DAC has in Washington. Uh, PHI is, you know, we never reveal PHI in the sessions, so please don't ever say anything that could um, convey information regarding patient or family members, uh, personal info. Uh, the sessions are all recorded, so you can they can be watched again, uh, or if you missed one and you wanna come back and review a topic. Uh, and then there's a one minute post session survey, so please do complete that. Um, it helps us to continue to improve um, this University of Washington Project Echo Dementia based on your input and feedback. So uh, upcoming, uh, the next Echo session in February is with Dr. Veronica Zantop on dealing with difficult behaviors. And then as you see uh, subsequent Echoes here, please consider bringing your cases forward. We really learn together when you bring your case forward, you're a vital part of the community. And, there's always an opportunity to learn. No case is you know, too simple or, or too complex. We will think about it together and um, learn more. So we have accreditation through University of Washington for one hour, one CME. We have no disclosures, no financial disclosures. And if there ever are, they're very, very carefully, uh, all these financial relationships have been mitigated in the event that there are any. Um, 
issues. They'll be fully disclosed. Here's our hub team, as you see, smiling um, here on Zoom and in the picture. Here you all are uh, in your uh, locations throughout Washington. So we provided lots and lots of instructional hours since the inception in June of 2020. And um, you know, over 70% of survey respondents say that they are incorporating a practice change based on these learnings. So, and we're growing and we wanna to continue to grow together. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're really delighted and so grateful to Dr. Kay Rubenstein, who, as I said, uh, is a geriatrician and directs the Geriatric Fellowship at Swedish. And she's gonna to speak to us today um, about dementia, comorbidities, and delirium risk prevention through team management. Thank you so much, Carrie, and I'll stop my share. My pleasure. Give me a second. How's that? Can you see my slides well? Fantastic. Um, I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I decided to change the title a little bit, um, but it's the same stuff and really talking about, um, I think many of us do primary care on this um, in this community, not all of us, some of us really focus in a specialty area, but, um, and it's really can extend from primary care to specialty care, but really this age-friendly approach to delirium prevention. How can we, prevent somebody from getting to the hospital where we know delirium happens anyway in the first place. So uh, Nancy already told you all who I am. Uh, I know many of you and it's really great to see names and faces. Um, in addition to my role uh, leading the Swedish Geriatrics Fellowship, I'm faculty at Swedish Family Medicine First Hill. Uh, shout out to Andrew Way on the call, one of our alum. Um, I, I have the privilege, the absolute privilege to do the job that I do, um, which allows me to practice in the clinic, in the hospital, in nursing homes, in adult family homes, and in private home settings. Like, so, so lucky, so, so privileged. And I also um, have the privilege of having the experience of uh, being the daughter of a dementia care partner. And there is uh, no doubt in my mind that is why I do what I do, and that is why I'm here, um, because I got to witness the beautiful care that my parents provided my grandmother while I was growing up. Goals well, today are to think about and to introduce you to the Age Friendly Health Systems 5M framework, but also to reintroduce you if it's something new to you, um, to describe uh, delirium risk kind of from the primary care perspective, um, and talk about how we can decrease delirium risk, uh, use the Age Friendly Health Systems framework uh, to think about prevention of delirium, I'll mention the patient priorities care tool, but that could be a talk in and of itself, really thinking about how to get at what matters to the people that you're caring for. And then I'm really excited to show an epic based tool that Providence has developed on the system level to improve age friendly care delivery. So this is, uh, these, this is the age friendly um, framework, which is the five M's, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, the John A. Hartford Foundation um, really started this effort in 2016, where they said, okay, we have evidence-based models such as PACE program that really deliver excellent care to older adults on a population basis. How can we get that out past some of these real niche type of settings? And so like a whole bunch of people got together and they decided that this framework, which Providence actually added the malnutrition, the first four were part of the age-friendly health systems framework by the IHI um, to, these are the essential care elements. Um, when we get away from thinking disease based, when we think about person based care, assessing and acting on this in a systematic way can improve care delivery through across care settings. And so we'll be, we'll be walking through the age friendly framework as it pertains to delirium prevention uh, in the coming slides. And so, so how does age friendly uh, health systems framework, improve dementia care. Well, we know uh, as every single talk on this series has shown, dementia care is whole person care at the core of which is, is the person living with dementia and the people that matter to them. Um, and so incorporating this framework and the five M's, assessing and acting on them with consistency can really help guide the care of people living with dementia um, across uh, care settings. And so why do we care about delirium? You know, and we could have a whole talk on like, just like what is delirium and, and why it matters. Um, 
but we we care about it here at Project Echo Dementia because many many people um, living with dementia um, are hospitalized, um, and this is these are the the stats um, from this one article, and uh, hospitalizations are. Uh, dangerous, really, for older adults living with dementia, um, and that hospitalizations in people living with dementia are associated with a serious increased risk of delirium. So that's really what we're trying to prevent, and that's really what this talk is really focused on, but also preventing the other things that happen when older people are in the hospital, um, including falls, um, acceleration of decline, readmission to the hospital, long length of stays, uh, long-term care admission, and death. So let me tell you about Pat. She's a patient of mine, 80-year-old um, person living at home with kind of a mid-stage mixed type dementia. She had had a recent stroke um, and uh, was hospitalized, uh, had urinary retention, was sent home from the hospital with a urinary catheter because she failed her trials of, of urinating on her own. She had uh, home health OTPT nursing. She actually also had a friend uh, her her health proxy and friend is a retired nurse who was looking after her. Um, so not 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 too bad of a situation. Um, and she like she was super depressed. And so you know not uncommon in people living with dementia and also in people experiencing stroke. Um, so we we started an SSRI for her in the hospital. She has really significant hearing loss. Um, uh, she has a, a, a caregiver not uh, and lucky to have one, especially in our com uh, community these days. Uh, she hates her catheter. <laughs> and um, we were lucky enough to visit her in the home after uh, her hospitalization. And no question, if you ask her what matters most to you is her cat. And her cat's name is Leah. And so these are her medical problems. And I would like in the chat for you guys to um based on what you've heard here like what are her delirium risk factors you know she's out of the hospital now which is great um but what are her delirium risk factors if you could just put them in the chat we'll see if i can see the chat too um poor hearing yes thank you andrew what other risk factors does she have for delirium Won't be shy. She has uh, dementia. She has urinary retention. All of these things are big risk factors. Thank you. She has a fully catheter. Um, oops, now I lost my, there we go. These are her medications. Um, and not, uh, we'll, we'll let Trang comment later, or maybe in the chat, this is not related to our, our case today, but these are her meds, not too many delirogenic meds. Um, thank you very much. She's got a geriatrics team looking after her. Um, but, and then thinking about the delirium risk factor she has, um, this is a mnemonic, which happens to be delirium. Um, and she has so many <laughs> delirium risk factors um medications including her new ssri could potentially um uh impact her cognition and her augmentation um electrolyte disturbances she has thyroid history of thyroid abnormalities she um had a uh, risk factor from the urinary tract she has reduced sensory input um she's got not only a uh, dementia but she had a stroke so that's a delirium risk factor in and of itself um and then um constipation and urinary retention. So, wow. And so I want us to be thinking about this as we're going through, thinking about what we could do to minimize um, Pat's risk of developing delirium um, and even also just identifying delirium. But in the meantime, um, I want to think about delirium and dementia a little further. And another preaching to the choir, early detection is so important here um, because um, sometimes delirium is missed in people li living with dementia 
um, because like they already are sort of assumed to have altered cognition. So a little worsening cognition isn't identified as delirium. And this article, which was interesting, suggests that this occurs um, often and is more likely to persist, so last longer, and associated with worse long-term outcomes than people with, with delirium um, who, are, who, do, who are not living with dementia. So we know how to prevent hospital delirium um, in, um, in, in general. We know a lot about how to prevent hospital delirium, um, and we're going to go through a lot of this, too, in the coming slides. Um, the Hospital Elder Life Program, if you haven't heard of it, is a wonderful program that I would love to see um, come to a hospital near me and you, um, but it's a, a sort of bundle of uh, interventions, um, including the issues uh, that, are, um, uh, uh, that are written out here. Um, and these are, this is what we know about preventing hospital delirium. Well, let's, let's apply this to the patients we see in our outpatient practices, both primary care and specialty. And let's start, let's start marching through our age-friendly health systems 5Ms. So when we're thinking about prevention, delir preventing delirium in people living with dementia, one of the most important things we can do is understand what matters to people living with dementia and their care partners. Um, because if we understand what matters to them, what we can do often is limit excess care that increases delirium risk. So how do you understand what matters to people? Um, I, I just offered a few, you know, a, a little bit of language you might consider using, what is important to you that we're gonna talk about today, what brings you joy, what concerns you most when you think about the health, your healthcare and your future, or the healthcare and, um, and future of your loved one? What things about your healthcare do you find bothersome? Because sometimes that opens the door to decreasing intensity of care and potentially decreasing risk of delirium. We're gonna talk a little bit about advanced care planning and serious illness communication, and uh, I believe it's the next slide. Um, but really, if we understand that people um, have limits to their care and don't want hospitalizations, for example, we can plan for that. And I do this all the time in people living with dementia, like what happens and we can offer things like hospice if people have a serious infection and they don't want to go to the hospital and they're just getting worse. But we need to know what they want first because everyone's preferences will be different. And then I'll mention this again at the end, but care partner support, training care partners to identify and act on delirium is key and critical. So um, we got Varak here, who is one of our uh, specialists in advanced care planning, especially in people living with dementia. But I'm just going to offer some dis dis food for thought here about our advanced care planning processes and how they overlap and are somewhat different in certain circumstances to serious illness communication. But a lot of this are developing the skills to um, basically talk to people about their preferences in the case of their serious illness and guiding, discussing values and goals. And ultimately, I put in green down here, making recommendations for folks. Because a lot of times people are looking to us to, for make, to, to make a recommendation. And a lot of times I believe there's too much autonomy in some of uh, the care that we are providing. But making a recommendation based on the values and goals of the people that you're caring for could be delirium prevention in and of itself, right? Making, um, thinking about how to limit some of this excess care. Moving on to medications. Assessing and acting on medications that can cause delirium is a huge, important, worthwhile thing for us to do. So if we're choosing a medication, we want to choose one that doesn't impact with mobility, that doesn't impact with mentation, and that is really consistent with what matters. That is all about this age-friendly approach. We, we know, uh, and there are many talks in this um, series about identifying high-risk medications, um, and this is just a reminder. Um, I think it's always important to pay special attention to anticholinergic burden because anticholinergic burden um, is so important in, in incident dementia, but also as we know in delirium. Um, and using the anticholinergic bur burden calculator, if you haven't already, is a great thing that you can do in your clinical setting. We just did a project on it in our clinic where we um, calculated anticholinergic burden before um, a geriatric comprehensive geriatric assessment, and then um, 
And then we calculated it uh, a few months later after the primary care provider got to see the patient again. Um, and, and thinking about how reducing anticholinergics is delirium prevention. And um, my plea for all of you is to um, educate everyone you know about this, because it's really surprising that a lot of our healthcare colleagues really don't know that things like divinhydramine um, can cause delirium, can lead to, um, if in cumulative dosing, um, things like dementia in the future. And so it's our job. To, to make sure people um, understand. There are great tools on deprescribing. Deprescribing as an, a, a verb is delirium prevention. So if you can identify um, medications that might lead to delirium and deprescribe them, you're, you're doing a huge service. Um, deprescribing.org is a really awesome website, that a tool that can help you do this. And they have um, methods to approach a number of different classes of medication, deprescribing them. Um, obviously, you know, delirium prevention is, is super important in, in dementia and in depression. Um, and early detection, like I said, understanding people's baseline is going to be really important in uh, understanding is this delirium, is this dementia, um, if somebody is presenting differently. Uh, we want to screen and treat depression aggressively as we can. We want to address social isolation and loneliness. Certainly, the pandemic. Um, really made this um, emergency crisis level issues. And these are, we know, social isolation and loneliness are delirium risk factors. And caring for the care partner is delirium prevention in and of itself, right? If you're going to have a good, healthy care partner that can calmly and carefully and thoughtfully care for somebody living with dementia, that's going to be a humongous um, uh, of humongous importance when, when we're thinking about um, the well-being of the person living with dementia. So um, this isn't a talk about early detection, but, but as everyone knows on this call, this is a really important thing, right? If somebody shows up to the ER and is altered, what are they altered from? Like, what is their baseline? Are they just showing up with dementia that somebody has, like somebody from out of town came and they were acting differently? Um, and so they brought them to the ER, but they're actually been like this forever and it is not delirium, it's actually dementia. Um, we have tools to uh, detect dementia early, and we really want to think about how to best use them. Um, from a mobility standpoint, you know, we know that these multi-component approaches, uh, including keeping people active, can prevent delirium in the hospital. There, and there's no question in my mind that this is true from the primary care out of hospital setting as well. If you can keep people active, if you can prevent the injury and the fall that's going to lead to the hip fracture, think about how many cases of deli hospital based delirium you're going to pre prevent. It's this is, you know, cannot be understated how important it is to keep people active, to keep people mobile, to allow them to do the things that they want to do. Um, nutrition, hydration, hydration. Um, this is important and this is hard when caring for people living with dementia who have a decreased thirst response can, might be inattentive and not be able to um, sit and, and um, complete a full serving of fluids who may have swallowing difficulties. We need to work hard with care partners um, in terms of uh, offering them solutions to prevent dehydration in people um, living with dementia and, and again, can impact um, their risk for delirium. So these are just a few suggestions from a, um, the standpoint of preventing dehydration. Some of these, I, I, I pulled this and put it together from a couple different sources. Some of these, I don't always talk to folks about, and so um, it's a good reminder to uh, bring this up. And from a nutrition standpoint, um, I know this has been on Project Echo Dementia um, talks before, but just um, knowing uh, about the MIND diet, which is sort of a Mediterranean slash DASH diet um, uh, uh, intervention, and um, which is really um, important for uh, focusing on 
um, nourishing the mind, right? Um, we there was a, a there happened to be a recent study in the New England Journal um, looking at whether the mind diet prevents dementia, and it did not suggest that it prevented dementia. But I think we can all agree that nourishing the mind um, is really important in people living with dementia, and that nutri nutritional deficiencies can put people at risk for delirium. And so, if you're going to eat your plant-based diet, your berries, your uh, your beans, um, your fish, you're going to really go a long way to those nutritional deficiencies that could put people at risk for delirium and progression of their dementia. So what else can we do? We can make uh, care partners aware of what delirium looks like and train them on how to identify delirium. Because if we identify it early, there are sometimes things that we can do to reverse it. And so we want to talk to uh, care partners, not about the common uh, hyperactive delirium that people think about, agitated and restless, but about the more common hypoactive delirium where people are like increasingly drowsy, sleeping a lot, reduce awareness of their surroundings. And there are certain tools that we can use. And on actually the next slide, there's tools about um, tools for the care partner. But these are tools that we can use um, even in the uh, primary care setting, some of which are hard in people living with dementia because their ability to answer questions may be altered at baseline before they experience delirium. Um, but these are tools, uh, the 4AT, the CAM tool, and the UB2. These are tools for you guys to know about and look up um, that can be used um, in the clinical setting. But I think this one is super interesting. So this one is the CAM tool, which is a confusing assessment method um, aimed at families. So the FAM CAM tool. Um, and it, it, it really, I think any good tool really trains people, like the people who are giving the tool, like us, on how to talk to people about identifying certain things. And I think that's the case from this tool. So asking family members um, to comment on concentration and alertness, things that we know are altered in delirium, um, more so than in dementia, um, and to report on that to us. Um, I think I have just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to speed through, but the other place where we can play a you're, role you're in the okay. patient setting. Terry. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're okay. You can take, yeah, you're good. Just Okay, okay. cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the outpatient setting is we we want to risk stratify people preoperative preoperatively. We want to understand the risks of a potential surgery and understand the benefits and the risks are surgery and anesthesia are potent stimuli to delirium, right? Um, and we want to understand the benefits of the procedure. Uh, we want to understand what the baseline cognition is, right? So you want to update a cognitive evaluation. We want to try to de-prescribe high-risk medications and just discuss what matters most. And so, for instance, I have a 92-year-old who is pretty healthy um, and really wants her knee replaced. And, you know, that she saw the orthopedic surgeon and, you know, we're sort of continuing to talk about the risks and the benefits and, you know, age is just a number, but like she has higher risk of some of these, um, uh, higher risk of delirium, even though she, she doesn't have dementia at baseline, but, in, in, and so it's not quite, you know, in, in the wheelhouse of what we're talking about today, but for people living with dementia, um, surgeries come up all the time, like the TAVR or the, um, you know, or fixing a hernia. And, you know, we have to think about that some of these surgeries are going to be appropriate and we're going to figure out what they, which ones they are. We're going to speak up if we don't think that they're necessary and a watchful waiting approach instead. And if they do proceed, decide to proceed with surgery, we're going to think about updating their cognitive evaluation, deprescribing high risk meds, thinking about a pain plan after surgery, and making sure their people are sort of ready to care for them. Um, and also in the sort of context of what matters, um, I would love to know if you can just put in the chat if you've heard of um, the patient priorities care model. Um, this is um, really being spread widely in terms of how in people with like multi-complexity, multiple chronic diseases, how do we develop a care plan that actually not only tries to address the like 
umpteen, you know, recommendations on guidelines for CHF and COPD and diabetes, but also, and importantly, identifies the values um, that people are um, uh, that, that mean a lot to people in developing their care plan. I know PACE folks, because there's several PACE folks that are on the call, I know they're doing this um, and they're implementing this, but I, I don't know how many of the rest of you have heard of this. And, and, and if you don't now, you, you probably will. Um, but this is this concept that um, we think about certain interventions and that's often sometimes this means surgery but often means like medications and tests um and we try to utilize a specific way to communicate and help folks make a decisions uh, related to what their ultimate goals are in terms of function um, and longevity and this is just a like idea of how how we do this and you use you can use this template um and it can look a little differently but basically what you're trying to get at is like what's important to you what are your important health goals what's bothersome to you like is your high dose diuretic bothersome to you and is there any way to reduce the dose for example um what are your health care preferences what do you think is helpful in your care now what is burdensome in your care now and this is actually one of the most important things about the process is it tries to get from the patient and the care provider's perspective what is the one thing that like you want me to help you with and like so for example in this case the most important health goal is being less tired having less pain in my hand so i can continue to watch my grandchildren and volunteer in the library handling books um and so trying to understand that then helps us better advocate for our patients with specialists but also um decide on sort of uh, cer certain interventions we're not going to be able to like stop, for instance, um, a diuretic in somebody with advanced heart failure would probably make them more symptomatic and less able. But there are circum certain circumstances where we can adjust the care plan based on people's preferences, and we should. Um, so this is cool. Nancy, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is Providence system level. Um, it's called the 5M snapshot. So if you can see the mobility, what matters most, malnutrition, mentation, medications. Um, and what it does, this is not a great, <laughs> I should have pulled one that had actually better. It, it's, it's. Uh, it, I think it, it needs to be refined. But what it does is it pulls mobility screenings. It pulls malnutrition documentation. It pulls, like in this case, it pulled a MOCA score of 24. Um, it pulls advanced care planning documentation. It pulls medications. And the I concept is that for handoffs in the hospital, if my patient shows up and they know that her MOCA was 24 and she's acting in a certain way, you know, a year ago and she's acting in a certain way, that might be helpful in understanding um, and also important in preventing uh, delirium during our hospital stay. Trying what I would love this medication section would be to pull the high risk meds, but I haven't figured out how to do that. So it's just one way that our technology and our tools can um, can can help. Um, this is not well, this is related, I will say, um, and really proud to be part of this um, brand new project that started in December, which is a delirium prevention pilot using what we call our Care for Me companion cart. So you have a whole bunch of stuff that's in this cart, the intention is to distract and to engage uh, patients living with dementia um, who are either experiencing delirium or at risk for delirium, um, utilizing our patient safety assistance, uh, PSAs, and also our health scholars. So um, I can't tell you for how long I've wanted something like this so that you're not constantly walking in patients' rooms and they're just like sitting there doing nothing. Um, and we're starting small, but we're really like excited about this project. So hopefully at this point, at the end of my talk here, we've re you've, we've reviewed age-friendly health systems framework. You're more familiar with it. We understand better delirium risks from the LSA ambulatory perspective. Uh, you can use the age-friendly health systems framework to actively prevent delirium in people living with dementia. And we should be thinking about this all the time. You've learned a little bit about the patient priorities care tool, and I've showed you an Epic-based tool that Providence has developed to improve age-friendly care delivery. Uh, here are some resources. I'm happy to share my slides if you guys want to refer to something else. And I would be delighted to answer some questions.
Thank you, Carrie. What a terrific talk. Wow. Um, have you been using that fam cam? I'm curious. No, but I, I, I like to, um, I haven't, um, I think there's some, I, it could be like a really interesting QI project, um, to, um, utilize them. Yeah. So wonderful. Um, all the tips and tools and to, to think about, you know, identifying delirium for our community. So I'm curious from the community, any comments or questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, Introduce yourself and ask Carrie a question, or if you prefer, put it in the chat and we can um, read it for you. Yeah, I see Lynn. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Lynn, would you use the fam cam when presenting with delirium or more as a baseline? Um, I could see using this in a, a, a patient, like, like if I'm getting my patient ready for surgery as the primary doc, like, hey, keep keep an eye on these things. You don't necessarily, I wouldn't have them fill it out, but like, these are the things to look out for um, while your loved one is in the hospital, but also um, like post-op, you know, post-op setting to, to give it to a family member. And then if it's not clear, if we're like thinking, is this delirium or not, that would be a great use of that tool. Cause that care partner of course is gonna know um, their loved one the best. Emma? Thanks, can you Emma. hear me okay? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm on some new headphones, but I have a question about overactive bladder medications. So I know most of our older adults, of course, we're going to have a urinary frequency and overactive bladder, and a lot of them are on oxybutynin, and we try to, you know, mention that that can cause cognitive impairment. Um, and in my research, I've read that mirabegron is less anticholinergic. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Although in my experience, it seems like it's expensive and not always covered. Um, yeah. Do you have any suggestions about overactive bladder medications? And you know, is that medication truly less anticholinergic? Mirabegron is less anticholinergic. It uh, it has other potential. It like works differently, and it has other potential side effects, including um, hypertension. Interestingly, um, yeah. and I I haven't found it to be that effective, and it's always uh, a cost issue. So unfortunately, <laughs> um, it, it is, it's something in train you can talk to, like it, it, it's something to consider. Um, a, a lot of people still don't know that oxybutynin is problematic. And so actually just saw somebody yesterday who has MCI and we had a talk about stopping her oxybutynin. Um, and she said like, yeah, like I'm scared. I don't want to this to progress. Like, if you think this is going to make a difference, I'm willing to stop it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn more, but, um, vaginal estrogen has, uh, some evidence, not only in prevention of UTI, but also in overactive bladder. And so just the whole genitourinary syndrome of menopause idea is like, everybody should be on vaginal estrogen. Um, and so it's a tough one though, because this really does impact people's function. And I have had people come in and say, this is the only thing that works. And like, I'm willing to take the risk. Yeah. Thank you. And Karen. Hi, everybody. My name is Karen Hayes. I'm the, the care partner representative on the echo dementia. And Carrie, I've I have a question that's probably a topic for a whole nother talk, um, but it comes up in the dementia support groups and usually pretty robust and not, um, not everybody has the same ideas about, you do the advanced care planning, the person who has MCI or is coming into knowing they're gonna have this advanced uh, dementia disease. Um, they say what their preferences are in their advanced planning and their pulse and all that. And then as the dementia advances, they may be like my husband who just would agree to anything that anybody said, but I know as his wife, that's not what he wanted, you know, or you have the kind of person that just rejects everything and doesn't want anything, but maybe that wasn't what their advanced planning had said. So um, it seems tricky to me. Um, and I've heard lots of different stories now about, do you, do you honor what the person with dementia says in the moment? Like, sure, give me IVs. Yeah, I'd love to be intubated. You know, that when they don't really have cognitive capacity um, uh, or- it's so hard, yeah. Your partner's supposed to stick to that thing. Like, no, I know <laughs> I wanted this. And it's 
really sticky. So that's why I say it's probably a whole nother talk. It's it's an excellent question, but it's one of the reasons why I make a point to say that we should give a recommendation um, because in the best case scenario, we know that we know what the preferences have been over time. Not always, but but in the best case. So we've we've known that. We we've had those conversations. You know your loved one. And together, based on the decision we need to make and the risks and benefits, um, including the person living with dementia when we can, we make the best decision. Um, but I have seen many times where the, you know, request for a feeding tube at the end of life was solely because the individual living with dementia said they wanted it when they would not did not in the and that is not the right thing to do okay and so we have to skillfully and carefully be part of the decision making process um, and we can't leave that to the care partner like that's too much of a burden we, we include them of course but at least that's my opinion Thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much. And then Trang, last question before we move on to the practice dilemma. I just want to comment about the overactive bladder that Carrie mentioned earlier. Yes, it is true. A lot of those my patients have high antiponergic side effects and the mobitric or mor morabigron here has less, but it's more expensive and increasing blood pressure is an issue. Um, but I think when we start those medications, we ask the patient, is, is it really helping the patient? What I find out that the patient has not, is they find that it's not helping them um, at all. And they eventually said, I, I don't think uh, I still have the same number of, of, of um, either accidents or I still have to wear pads. You know, so ask about how many pads that they use or they change per day. You know, before the drug, we need to be changed eight times a day. And with the drug, you go down to seven times a day. You know, so just kind of ask them that. And a lot of times they find that. Patients find that it's not helpful and they eventually they stop it. You request. Thank you. But yeah, it is expensive for the um, obituary. Oops. Thank you so much. I think you're not seeing the screen, but I thought you were seeing. Um, and now uh, let's move to the practice dilemma with Dr. Sylvia Russo, who um, is a cognitive neurologist. In Spokane, thank you, and take it away, Sylvia. Thank you for having me. Um, I am going to share my slides. Um, let's see if I can do that real quick. Can you guys see the correct screen? I'm not sure. Uh, can yeah. you guys see? Yeah, no, we see. Perfect, perfect. Perfect. Okay, sorry. Looks great. We um, see the full, yes. Perfect. Excellent. So um, uh, I know that some of us uh, have met in the past. I work here as one of the main cognitive behavioral neurologists. And the case I present is a little bit complicated, uh, but the main core of it is how to manage a resistant type of agitation in an early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, in a rural setting in a patient family social setting with kind of poor health literacy. So just more detail, she presented about, um, this is a 58 currently when she presented 57 year old right-handed female. Cognitive changes started quite several years before that. She was more irritable, trouble producing words, um, then started declining more with uh, driving, visual spatial function. She worked as an MA and she started having significant difficulties at work. Um, and so she was unfortunately let go. Um, and during this period per her husband, she started becoming sweeter in this position with still periods of irritability, which has worsened significantly in the last one to two years. And um, starting in 2019, um, so, so four years ago, five years ago now, more difficulties with praxis, multitasking, and progressively more difficulty doing basic things. There has been some social stressors, and the story varies every time her husband approaches it. And it's hard to discuss in the clinic because one daughter is invariably present um, more recently, but 
one daughter that now seems to be more caring for her, seems to want some money compensation. The other one seems to be very active user of cannabis, which the patient did not seem to like when she was able to express her preference and the husband doesn't like. When I saw her first, she was really advanced, could only name a pen out of all the points of the Minimento, uh, really stimulus bound, repeating the sentences that I said. She had, it, um, she, she had it, an, an inability to kind of express her thoughts. Um, and also some subtle signs of motor slowing as well. Um, during this year, she started having more agitation in the setting of having what she reported as belly pain and groin pain, difficult for her to localize. She was found to have acute on chronic cholecystitis, which was removed, complicated by biliary duct leak and stenosis. So she now has to go in regularly for these procedures to dilate the bile duct under sedation. Um, and this setting, but also with the progression of dementia, um, she has gotten way more agitated. And there are some things that seem to make it better, like going on long car rides. Her husband says that most of the time that helps. Spending time at one of her daughter's house, that has been helping some. Uh, because her daughter sometimes give her some, gives her some simple tasks to do, but now she's less and less able to do even the simple tasks like folding towels, putting things back in the drawers. And she's had some UTIs, the abdominal pain seems to aggravate the issue, being bored or being too stimulated. These are all the classical triggers. Um, and of course, we have the social determinants into this history, meaning um, their poor health literacy. At one point, they wanted to stop all the medication and just give her cannabis vape. Um, at another point, they wanted um, diazepam because it seemed to help uh, when it was given as a one-time PRN in the ER um, to which they presented for this agitation. They live in Whitman County. Uh, there are economic limitations. The daughters appear very supportive um, and trying to help as best as they can. Um, and um, we were able to do some workup on her when she first presented. So she came with this MRI already, which was done a couple years before. And I try to take some um, snapshots of it. I hope that it's clear enough, but you see at 55 years old, there's quite a bit of hippocampal atrophy. There's quite a bit of it's coming up kind of perisylvian and parietal atrophy. There is also a bit of white matter disease, possibly an old stroke in this kind of a left parietal area. On the other sequences, there were no acute strokes, no other issues, but there is definitely a lot of atrophy for her age. And um, let me see, we were able to do a lumbar puncture for her. It was really hard otherwise to, you know, give them a straight diagnosis. And it does show clear um, evidence, at least to my knowledge, of Alzheimer's disease. So that kind of helped us clarify in an advanced situ situation what this issue was. She didn't have oligoclonal bands in her fluid. And when she came to me, her primary doctor who has experience in geriatrics was trying to help her as best as he could. Uh, she was on valproic acid um, done for behavioral issues, not for seizures. Um, Donepezil, um, Lexapro at five milligrams and um, Trazodone occasionally for sleep. Uh, we try to use the trazodone as needed for agitation, and that initially seemed to help, but then with the biliary issues, um, and that was complicated by delirium, it helped less. And then I kind of went back and looked at all the medications we tried. So in the past, she tried a good amount of sertraline, really high doses, did not seem to help. Uh, the valproic acid was stopped in the setting of her hospital stay for biliary issues. Uh, there was a concern for her liver enzymes being elevated. Um, and also they had started her on olanzapine in the hospital, which seemed to really help at first. But then as the months went by and she was discharged, it stopped helping. She had a really bad reaction to really low doses of quetiapine. Um, and her Lexapro, I tried to up titrate, but for her husband, 
it made the anxiety worse. So some sort of paradoxical anxiety, which persists. So her primary doctor kind of reduced it back. The trazodone, I try to bring it up, up to 50 milligrams three times a day. It did cause some sleepiness and at the end it wasn't helping. So it was down titrated. And then finally, uh, kind of pushed against the wall because they were really uh, showing me that she was suffering with these episodes, that the non-pharmacological techniques only took it so far and she was starting to scratch and actually be physically aggressive. I started her on risperidone. We try to up titrate it, but she's now got worsened Parkinsonism. So that kind of self-limited it. And currently she's on a small dose of mirtazapine, donepezil, um, risperidone. Um, and last I saw her mid-January, we did start a little bit of memantine. And the discussion that has been going on in the background is, you know, trying to inform them that this is an advanced presentation and try to consider, you know, what her prior wishes had been. She did care for her grandmother who had a pretty severe form of dementia. And she had expressed over and over to her daughters that she would not want to go in a nursing home and that she would not want aggressive treatment and quote unquote, she would not want to be um, a lab rat. Uh, meaning she would not want to try any new or an experimental treatments. And their main objective is try to keep uh, these symptoms at bay so that she's comfortable. Now, uh, my main next steps are, um, we will probably need to down titrate the risperidone because it seems like it's affecting her gait and her mobility. Um, and, um, kind of discussing the goals of care with this patient and their family. Um, you know, the primary doctor valiantly pointed out that Rigzolpi is now FDA approved for uh, agitation in Alzheimer's disease. But it being a newer medication, I really haven't had much experience with it. That that's one of my questions, if anyone in the group has tried it in this kind of situation of an early onset patient. Um, with so much agitation and so advanced and, and what things to watch for. And the ongoing need for these procedures where it seems like if she goes too long without having her bile duct dilated, she then again has abdominal pain. So it's kind of a symptom comfort type of thing. We also address the need for hospice. And that's one of the hard topics because most insurances will want a life expectancy of six months, which obviously is hard to describe or, or predict. Um, initially, her husband shut this down and he said, I will never hear this word again. Uh, the daughters seem to be more open to it. Now that things are a little bit worse, her husband seems to be more open to this discussion. And so I've given them um, some of the phone numbers and resources. There has been a lot of issues with the family providing updates frequently and often contrastingly. Maybe one thing helps a bit and then th they come in a couple of days later saying, oh, it doesn't help. And so how, how, if you were in my shoes, how would you help communicate choices more effectively? And um, um, ideally, I would not want to move her to, you know, a memory care in this situation because it's against her goals of care that she previously expressed. And it would be quite a traumatic change at this point. Um, only things I found on Rexalti, um, mainly the study that led to the FDA approval this year, where it seems like a dose of two milligrams um, seems to be effective in reducing a scale of agitation. There is the concern for Parkinsonism because it is a partial D2 agonist. And there is the concern for interaction with um, antidepressants, um, serotoninergic agents, because it's also a partial um, serotonin receptor um, agonist. And so curious to know, um, I'll go back to the main uh, kind of questions. Um, what do you think? And happy to answer any questions um, about the case. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Sylvia. Great case. And 
Um, I'm wondering from our community if, if there are any additional questions for Sylvia before we offer um, to share some comments or suggestions. Any clarifying questions? From anyone? Uh, this is Karen. I guess I have a question about, you know, thinking about hospice coming up and so forth. And, um, you know, morphine is used a lot in hospice. Is that still an issue with gallbladder and, um, you know, gallbladder duct issues? Um, so her liver function has normalized um, now. Um, I am not sure how cholestasis will affect it um, because she does still have a little bit of cholestasis. Her bile duct flow is reduced based on what the GI doctor told me. Um, and, uh, and so it, it may be um, potentially a step taken if they go within that setting of the hospice, um, you know, um, and so I, I did tell them about the rules of the insurance, like, you know, you need to have a six month life expectancy. If I don't certify that, many of the hospice facilities here will say, well, no, because this is a young person, she doesn't qualify for hospice, despite many of us know that an advanced dementia may be a good, a good qualification uh, for this. And I've had success for another young patient that came in situ similar situation, pretty advanced. And the way I argued with it was, you know, while with cancer, we have very clear scales, you know, and scores such as the Karnofsky performance score that tell us pretty accurately, person with advanced cancer, how much do they have to live? Uh, only now, that I think there is a study from UCSF trying to figure out a score that has to do with how much the person can do independently, what kind of symptoms do they have to tell us, you know, are they good candidates for hospice or not, but it's not qualified or codified, should I say. And most people rely on the Karnofsky performance score, which is a cancer score from what I understand, to decide on dementia, which is a very different disease, I would not feel comfortable just having this person be on benzos and morphine outside of a hospice setting because it needs monitoring. And with the potential drug use from one of the daughters, you know, it seems like now it's only cannabis, but her husband hinted at the fact that she was using other drugs before. It's a little bit of a dicey situation for me to just give them this and they need to drive three hours to get to me. They don't know how to operate a video visit. We're just working on that now. But yeah, ideally, yes, I agree with you. Morphine would be a better thing. And I discussed it with them and he was way more open this time because I think he needs time to process that his wife is declining, obviously. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have experience in doing this, um, you know, in a person who's not in hospice um, thanks. and kind of doing this from the clinic, basically. Mimi, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, Sylvia, thank you. These These patients are so incredibly difficult. And you are so right, a young age, and they don't meet the, cri the current criteria for hospice. And the reality is, as we all know, the hospice benefit was designed for cancer patients, and it doesn't fit these patients. And the patients that we often see and accept are patients uh, often with a story like this, and they've begun to lose weight because they, they just stop eating or they're too agitated. And we often admit them under the diagnosis of protein calorie malnutrition. So my question is, number one, has she started to lose weight? Or no. if they no, yeah. And sometimes the medications they're on actually make them gain some weight. I mean, it's not good, 
you know, lean body mass, but so that can be confusing. The other issue is, you know, the behaviors that are really refractory to multiple, multiple medications and good documentation of that and coordination. And we've had, um, we've had more, we've had a number of these patients in our hospice unit that honestly end up on, on sedation because there is nothing else that works. Yeah. But it's exhaustive. It's absolutely exhaustive. Usually the family finally gets to a point where they're accepting of that. Otherwise, they end up in the hospital for months. Exactly. And in the hospital, their care is at four point restraints, you know, as opposed to medication. And in my mind, it's absolutely inhumane. But I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Um, and I think you're absolutely right to uh, point towards, you know, this might not be possible, even though the goals of care are for her to age in place, this this mm -hmm. type of care may not be possible mm -hmm. in the home and, and hospital as is absolutely, you know, will intensify her delirium as we saw and would just not be humane. Um, Barack? Yeah, I, I mean, the the question of sort of where she should be living is incredibly hard. And it, I, 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 I kind of cringe whenever I see like, you know, I don't want to be in a nursing home on an advanced directive because nobody wants to be in a nursing home, <laughs> you know, like everybody will sort of check that box. And, um, and, and, and yet there are situations exactly like this one where if, she could sort of like, you know, magically the person who she was from 10 years ago could magically be at our side and look upon herself now and see like, you know, the horrible sort of like care and chaos that she was getting outside of a memory facility. She would say, oh yeah, I guess in this case, mm -hmm. you know, put me in a memory facility. And and so I think that's the way that I would, um, try to approach this decision of where she should be, where her preference before didn't necessarily anticipate just how bad things are right now. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, she might say like, oh my God, you know, shoot me in the head <laughs> if she could sort of really see herself now. Um, and if we were to say, well, we can't do that, then she'd say, yes, I guess then I sort of would want to be in a memory facility where, I mean, that's it, it that, I, I, you know, it, 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 I'm, I'm blanking on the, uh, the wonderful, uh, guy's name from Southern California, who is like such a, has done such fundamental work in palliative care. But I mean, a talk that I saw him give once was, you know, like the, the worst thing that anybody can ever say is like, you know, whatever you do, don't put me in a nursing home because that just like sets them up and the family up for like excruciatingly horrible mm -hmm. sort of guilt feelings when mm -hmm. there really is no other option. Thank you, Brock. Um, Karen. Clay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, such a such a hard case. You know, I'm wondering a couple of things that, um, you know, whether or not the families really kind of maximize services available to them. Um, so that they probably live in the catchment area for the um, uh, aging and long-term care of Eastern Washington. And, uh, you know, I saw that one of the comments was that the daughter wanted to get paid to be a caregiver. Um, and it's possible that she sh could be paid to be a caregiver. Um, FYI, her spouse cannot be paid to be a caregiver, but children could um, if they get um, a set, if they can pass a background check and do a pretty small training. Um, you know, also with the Washington paid leave program, if any of them have worked enough, and really when we say enough, it's really just, just over half time work for about a year, then they might qualify for the Washington paid leave program so they could get some additional income. I just wonder if that would help decrease some of their stress and strain as they try to do it. Um, and then also there, there is a dementia program in each of the area agency on aging, including through aging and long-term care of Eastern Washington. So that sort of more, you know, coaching for the family members about like, 
like how to respond to agitation, um, support groups, um, possibly even respite benefits, depending on their situation. Um, that might help the family feel supported um, uh, in kind of emotional and maybe some practical ways. Great. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Anybody else with some recommendations or thoughts for Sylvia? For this very complex, challenging, uh, impossible situation. Really, really tough. I'm curious if um, you've talked with them about maybe just stopping the bile duct dilation, um, if, if she's able to go on hospice. Yeah, we actually talked about it twice in a row um, because she gets propofol with each of these. Seems to be tolerating it fine, except that there is this worsening agitation. And they were open to stopping it. Um, and I explained to them, you know, when we go on hospice, it's not that we stop caring, we just care differently. Uh, so the goal of it is to keep her comfortable, which is again, one of her prior wishes and that they are very clear on that. Um, and so we would stop doing the bowel dilations. And I talked to the GI specialist and he just said, you know, outside of a hospice setting, if you don't do the bowel dilation, um, you know, I forgot all that area of the body. So internists, forgive me, but it's, it's, she will probably get jaundice and she will have severe pain because the up, upstream bile ducts keep dilating and dilating and she doesn't have a gallbladder anymore. And so it's just a painful situation is what they explained to me. And he is, he's very reluctant to do these procedures. Um, and the first time I told them this, he just picked up and didn't show up to her planned dilation, which made her feel worse. And then eventually I said, well, it's, it's, he said, well, I understood you told me to talk to him, but since I didn't hear from him, I assumed that we didn't have to do the dilation. So, you know, um, now she did another dilation. They're trying to get in contact for yet another one. It happens once every couple months, you know. But definitely, I don't think this is a really safe situation. I don't think the GI specialist is too excited about it, but it seems like a necessity for as long as she's outside of the hospice. But obviously, if she's in hospice, then they can give her morphine or low dose of opioids, you know, to keep her comfortable. Thank you. And um, in the chat, Lynn has posted the link um, to um, the area aging and long-term care for Eastern Washington. And then Karen Clay posted for Lorenzo's house, which we had a talk um, here from someone recently and you know, focusing on early onset dementias. And Trang, please. Hi, Sylvia, very complex case. Thank you for presenting. Uh, with her de uh, dementia, do you have an idea if she can express her pain? Okay, there we go. So um, she has been able to express the pain, but it's getting really hard for her. Sometimes she says she has pain in her toe when instead she has pain in her belly. When I visited with her, I kind of checked on her belly and she didn't have any grimacing or any kind of basic reaction but it seems like it presents mostly with increased agitation right before she needs a new procedure. That's the only thing I've been able to describe. She was in real pain before her gallbladder procedure, and that has not recurred. Um, and then she's had groin pain as well. I don't know if that's referred pain or somatization or her inability to say, but yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, this pain can also increase agitation. So regarding the medication, Rosoki, uh, I haven't had any experience at all because it's so new. Uh, I just uh, know that the cost is very expensive. It's like 1500 compared to other medications. Do you find that uh, the metazapine is helping her? Um, so hard to say. I It was one of the things that I was trying to increase after adding the memantin. Um, 
she sleeps a lot. Um, but just recently, she started waking up at night before the last visit on the 17th. She was sleeping consistently through the night. So I think that effect, she came on with it, I believe. And I think that, if, or we added shortly after I saw her. And I think that's the effect it's doing at the lowest dose. So, yeah, I added the memantin because sometimes it can have calming effect and they're just in the up titration stage. So I still don't know if it's working. And so I like to do one thing at a time. But yes, I don't feel comfortable with Rexalti, especially in a situation like this where she cannot really tell us much. Um, but the other thing would be increasing the mirtazapine and or, you know, adding buspirone, although that's a milder medication. I don't think it's going to cut it. Yeah, I think uh, with uh, starting mirtazapine, I think it's a good idea to wait until to see that how that uh, uh, how that uh, helps her. Um, but the Zalti is a short study, 12 weeks, and they um, compare a low dose, you know, one milligram. I, from, I read one milligram didn't work, two milligrams worked, um, but it uh, caused some weight gain. Uh, so I was going to ask if, if, if she needed weight gain, um, it looks like the, 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 uh, uh, Mimi already asked that. Um, but I would say probably as of now, probably wait for the, you know, for the man that, see how that, you know, for starting so well. I think the next one, oh, and then I think another question you have was the drug action with the Lexapro and metazapine. Are mm -hmm. you worried about the serotonin syndrome? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, usually, is, have you seen uh, already happening for her serotonin symptom? Because because if we started on Zoralti, it has the same reaction uh, like Lexapro and Metazapine. It's not, it's not different in regard to, um, in regard to uh, interaction. Um, but using um, the serotonin syndrome is not as common. Yeah. I'm not too worried about her being on both Lexapro and Mirtazapine. It's, uh, you know, if you've ever given, and I'd be curious to know if you ever give it, you know, uh, in the study, uh, the patients were allowed to be on antidepressants as long as they were stable for at least a month and same with memory drugs. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, in an advanced patient, would there be a really high risk, you know, of serotonin syndrome if I just added Rexulti on top of Lexapro on top of mirtazapine, um, which to me, you know, really hard because it's not a reliable family to report on things accurately. So you kind of have to report it for them in a way or watch it for them. Um, so that would be my concern is to add the Rexulti on top of this and whether I should maybe peel off the Lexapro or one of them, you know. Thank you. And we just have about a minute. So Barack, would you like to? Yeah, I, I, I would just Here. recommend um, getting as many of the family members and as many of the care team providers together in a room and just making the case for um, that she's dying, you know, and that her biliary procedures are not prolonging her life. They're prolonging her dying. And that that the that it's almost uh, I think the odds are so high, given what we've heard, that if she were able to sort of be the, if the person who she was ten years ago could sort of be in the room with you now, she would say, you know, please do everything you possibly can to make me as comfortable as you can, which would be stop the biliary procedures, stop the biliary dilation, refer to hospice, and and try to sort of keep her comfortable as, as quickly and comfortably as possible. Thank you, Brock. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sylvia, for your fantastic care of this family in this very challenging situation. We can feel um, how how deeply you want to help them and how, how much you are really helping them. So thank you for bringing this case forward. I know we all learned a lot together. Um, and these are really hard cases and especially given her young age. And so uh, 
Thank you. And in the chat, as you see, again, how to collect your CME, 